Hi, and this is the lecture for Module 4. We're in 4.1, Vietnam, the second generation of anti-colonialism for our course Decolonization in Asia. So this will be the last case study that we look at. Uh, we are going to hopefully find many of the same things that we saw in the Chinese and Thai uh, case studies looking at different forms of anti-imperialism. The main difference here is, uh, perhaps somewhat strangely, for a course on decolonization for the first time looking at Vietnam, we're going to be looking at a place that was actually formally colonized. Nonetheless, I think we're going to see uh, some incredible similarity. There will be uh, similarities in the broad strokes of the development of the communist movement and its uh, various tactics over time. There will be similar logics in uh, right-wing thinkers and how they justify their governments based on, you know, metaphors of the family and the body and so on. So, as promised at the beginning of the semester, by the end of the semester, you're almost tired of hearing this, but that means we've reached a sort of intellectual saturation and you're getting it. These messages repeated over and over, both on the left and the right. The messages were very similar, right? So let's get into it then. In the mid 19th century, Vietnam was ruled by a Confucian bureaucratic style government under the last Vietnamese dynasty, the Nguyen dynasty. The Nguyen came to full power in 1802 when its founder, aided by sympathetic French missionaries, was able to convince the French government to send forces to help end a civil war that had been unfolding for over three decades between the North and the South. The Nguyen was Vietnam at its most centralized, where political power was most centralized around the Confucian bureaucracy that formed the core of the imperial apparatus. This was a government style that you don't need to know much about because it's about to fall apart, but you can know that it was uh, consciously, purposefully modeled on uh, Chinese examples. It was, however, also a short-lived dynasty in Vietnam, succumbing to French colonial conquest in the 18. 80s and existing as a puppet government from that point on until 1945. Now, as a final, uh, final sort of introductory remark, let me warn you now, uh, while we have been dealing with China and Thailand, both places where I have some respectable, if not uh, fluent knowledge of the languages, my pronunciation has been uh, reasonable. We are about to enter a world where my pronunciation is going to be terrible, so never at any point assume that I'm pronouncing any Vietnamese name or per any person's, uh, any place correctly, and I apologize to anyone in the class who does speak Vietnamese or has more familiarity with the language and who find my pronunciation to be like nails on a chalkboard, but uh, bad pronunciation or not, we need to get into it. So... Not all periods of imperialism are built exactly the same, and there is, in fact, a period that historians generally recognize as a period of high imperialism, running from roughly the Opium Wars in China to the First World War. Now, you will recall that the first Opium Wars in the 1840s were a British-Chinese conflict. The Opium Wars in the 1860s were a British-French and Chinese conflict. After the Second Opium War, so in the 1860s, this is when France really makes its move. It had a considerable amount of influence in Vietnam already, having helped the Nguyen Dynasty end the Civil War and found itself. But it's in the 1860s that, and thereabouts that we really see the French pressing on Vietnam. For the French, the point of controlling Vietnam was not Vietnamese resources, but instead the search for a river road to untapped markets in southwest China, specifically Yunnan province. In 1859 and 1867, French naval forces seized six provinces in the far south of Vietnam and turned them into a colony that they called Cochin China. Cochin China included the Mekong River Delta, and the hope 
was that French ships could sail up the Mekong River into, again, Yunnan Province, China. The Mekong, they soon discovered, is not a navigable river. It is populated by many long sections of rapids and waterfalls. So, the next step, then, was to gain control of the Red River in the north, uh, Hanoi, the capital in the, uh, in the north, previously Tanglong, is set on the uh, Red River. So the, the goal became if we can control the Red River, well then we can use that to move French goods into previously never before accessed markets in China. Between 1873 and 1885, the French forced the Nguyen Emperor to duck to transform central and northern Vietnam into French protectorates that become separated administratively, as we'll see in just a second. The Nguyen dynasty appealed to Qing China for military defense against the French, leading to the Sino-French War of 1884 and 1885, but by this is 20 years after China has already lost a war to Britain and France, and you can imagine how they fared. They lost. So, at the beginning, then, what I want you to see is French interests in Vietnam are not because of Vietnam. Primarily speaking, there are no resources in Vietnam that the French are after. Primarily speaking, there are no particular markets in Vietnam that the French want. The first thing that brings France to Vietnam is not Vietnam itself, but the hope to find a new way to get previously untapped markets in China that no one has been able to reach so far because until the Second Opium War, everyone was stuck working through the ports. And even some time after, there's still continued resistance to by the Qing government to allow foreigners to move through China. That's what the French are trying to get around in this colonial endeavor. The French divided Vietnam into three parts. In the very far south, there was Cochin China, and Cochin China is the only formal colony ruled by a French governor at Saigon and ruled by French laws. You can see a doubling of the maps here, the background and the map on the slide. The next section was Annam, which is in the center, and Tonkin in the north. Now, Annam was the largest of these regions. Tonkin uh, in the north, perhaps one of the most populated, along with Cochin China. But Annam and Tonkin, these were not on paper colonies. They were protectorates, and they were legally separated from each other in 1898. Each of these two, Annam and Tonkin, had two parallel governments. One was made out of French civil servants, and the other was made out of the old Confucian scholar officials, the old Confucian mandarins from the Nguyen dynasty. So that means that under French control, the Nguyen dynasty continues to exist, as I said earlier, but as a puppet government, as a dual government alongside French rule. If you look at the map, what you will see is down far in the south, you have Cochin China. Annam is the largest and most of the central region, Tonkin is at the very top. This map, of course, also includes, later included in French Indochina, Laos to the east, most of the northeast is Laos, and Cambodia in the sort of uh, southwest. Now, don't be fooled by this sort of complex political geography. In actual fact, all of Vietnam was a French colony. It was ruled by a single governor general of what the French called French Indochina, and this governor general resided not in Cochin China, the formal colony, but in Hanoi. No colonial power in history, however, rules without the help of local people willing to aid the colonial project to maintain personal power and security, or perhaps just to save their own hides. There were many collaborators in the Nguyen Confucian government who were happy to work with the French either to save Vietnam from further destruction or for more cynical reasons. 
So anti-colonialism in Vietnam is going to follow a very similar path to what we have seen in both China and Thailand, both in the terms of the time periods it comes up and the sort of ways the thought develops. Anti-colonialism in Vietnam came first and most significantly from Vietnamese students who began to travel to Japan in the early 20th century to acquire modern political and military training. For many of these students, like for many that we have seen in China and Siam, or Thailand, the problem was not really an issue of democracy. The problem that they saw for Vietnam was an issue of state weakness. The military and economy needed to be strengthened so that Vietnam could compete with other countries in Asia and eventually Europe. As we saw with the Guomindang in China, in the reforms these students proposed, there was a large emphasis placed on creating an idea of the nation around which Vietnamese people could rally. In 1925, one famous reformer, Phan Chao Trinh, pictured here, wrote that the Vietnamese people still, quote, know only their family and do not know their country. Very few great works of literature had been written in the French, uh, French, let's say, French boosted, French advanced vernacular written language of Guoc Ngu. Now, Guoc Ngu has existed for a long time. It was originally developed by a Portuguese missionary, Francisco de Pina. But the French sort of refined the system, the French began educating people in the system, the French put a lot of effort into making this system something that was broadly used, and if you need an example of it, uh, it is all over this slide and all over your reading, all of the Latin script with the other diacritical markers all over it, that is Vietnamese, that is uh, the written language, that is Guoc Ngu. So those Vietnamese helping serve French imperialism during the 20th century were those who had been in power during that period of French conquest in the 1860s to the 1880s. As the new educated elite came to age from 1920 to 1945, the French lost their control over Vietnamese politics. Just as China had its first cultural revolution during the May 4th era of 1919 to the 19, into the 1920s, and Siam, its first and less politically successful cultural revolution in the lead-up to the 1932 People's Party coup, Vietnam experienced a cultural revolution from roughly 1920 to about 1940, and the broad strokes of this cultural revolution are very similar to what they have been everywhere else. Moving your history away from dynastic histories and writing a history of the people, developing a literature, finding out what the national essence of your culture is and arguing about what that might be, arguing about why you can't compete with European powers, trying to strengthen the state, and through it, having a difficult relationship with some of the other political ideas that are coming in from the West, ideas about parliamentarianism, democracy, those sorts of things, do not totally interest the first generation of Vietnamese reformers. Because they're elites, right? I mean, how do you have enough money to go study in Japan if you're, you know, and be multilingual enough to handle it? Although many of them, because in Japan and China and Vietnam, everyone could write Chinese. All, all the elites could write Chinese. That's, in many cases, that's how they spoke. They had uh, conversations totally in writing. But you can imagine what's going on. They're traveling around. Their, their sons, their daughters of the elite, they are looking for a way to strengthen Vietnam without questioning their social position. This, at this point in the semester, should not be new. But let's talk about that cultural revolution. An enormous amount of that cultural revolution is tied to education and literacy. And let me impart something to you that a great mentor of mine from the University of Wisconsin-Madison imparted to me and imparts to all of his students in his introduction to Southeast Asian civilization. If you ever find yourself in the position that you are the governor general or an overseas minister in a classical imperialist apparatus, right? If, you're, if you are running a colony, 
do yourself a favor and don't teach anyone how to read. Because as soon as you start teaching them how to read, a lot of bad things happen. As soon as you start teaching them how to read, although they have many native peoples of any colonized place always have the urge to resist, always have ways of thinking through the unjustness of foreign rule, it's nonetheless the case that all these ideas about liberty, equality, fraternity or solidarity, at this time it would be fraternity, that the French propose for themselves, once the Vietnamese elites can read, they can read these things and they start using that language as a critique, right? It also has one other important element, this, edu this issue of literacy and education. Once there's a critical mass of people in the colonies that can read this colony you are hypothetically running, then those people can communicate. They can create political newspapers. They can begin to imagine what else is going on in the colony. They can, their, their community, as we saw uh, Phan Chao Trinh complain, Vietnamese people only know about their families, they don't know about their country. Once people can read and they start reading a newspaper, they suddenly become newly able to imagine their country and imagine the people that make up that country and what they stand for and how they're being treated and who is this other country that's come in and oppressed us and things like this. So treating, teaching people literacy, if you are an oppressive colonial power, is generally speaking a bad move. By the way, this idea about imagining your country and the, the importance of literacy, the importance of mass media, not my idea, not uh, Ben Kiernan's idea, the author of your reading for this week. This idea comes from a text by Benedict Anderson called Imagined Communities. If you uh, are interested in reading it, send me an email. In any case, after the 1880s, it was the French, not the Vietnamese, who decided to keep the old Confucian bureaucracy and its examination systems alive. As in China, the Confucian examination system provided a clear path for Vietnamese elites to a career in government. If you could demonstrate sufficient expertise on the Confucian classics, well, then you could take this Confucian exam, and if you pass that Confucian exam, then you could become a civil servant. And there's sort of a meritocratic element to the way this used to work, that sort of in most of the East Asian mandarinates, governments run by these kinds of bureaucracies, fairly meritocratic, usually the case that a large number of people are eligible to take these tests, not just the elites. And it's an interesting sort of system. It's a, it's a clear path to a good job. It's a clear path to a sort of middling amount of power, but a life worth living. So because of that, that meant that Confucianism and uh, Chinese language, especially Chinese written language, were incredibly important to the elites in Vietnam. In Tonkin and Annam, the exam system was not abolished until 1919. That's the last Confucian exam system to be abolished in the world, and it's kept alive vestigial, like a sort of zombified exam system, a zombified Confucianism, not by the Vietnamese themselves, but by the French. Because they were using this to help find people to staff their puppet governments in Annam and Tonkin. After 1919, however, written Chinese, if there's no exams, it becomes increasingly irrelevant for educated elites. It was quickly replaced by widespread study and use of Guoc Ngu, the spread of Guangzhou script was aided by the decision of the Governor General of French Indochina, at the time uh, Albert, or I'm sure it's Albert, uh, Surat. I should apologize not just for my Vietnamese but my French pronunciations. The Governor General decided to stop charging tuition for the first six years of primary school, so it becomes genuinely public school, genuinely free. Literacy increased as enrollment grew from less than 5,000 in 1910 to more than 39,000 in Tonkin alone in 1920. The total number of enrolled students nationwide that year was 123,000. Through further reforms by French rulers, this figure 
reached 435,000 in 1930, including roughly 40,000 female pupils, an unknown, but we can guess probably similarly large numbers, of young women and girls who were studying how to read uh, the new written script unofficially at home. By 1938, perhaps as many as 1.2 million Vietnamese children had enough education that they could read their native language written in Guoc Nguyen. By 1939, a full 10% of the Vietnamese population was able to read a newspaper. All of this was creating a cultural frame for educated elites who, as I said at the beginning of this slide, were coming of age in a period where Chinese and Chinese traditions were far less important in imagining what it meant to be Vietnamese. The spread of literacy meant an increased audience for newspapers, for political pamphlets, for novels, all written in Guoc Ngu. The new literature no longer was interested in traditional themes of Confucian virtue and focused instead on things we might consider quite modern, modern, modern forms of romance. It was literature about economics. It was literature about social problems. And it was literature that celebrated or sometimes condemned Vietnamese culture. What really mattered, however, was that widespread literacy and the growth of a print media industry meant that increasingly more Vietnamese people were able to read about the same events or the same ideas at the same time throughout the country. They were able to join, to varying extents, a national discourse for the first time on what Vietnam was and what it should be. Even if many people helping produce that discourse disagreed with one another, they were at least now all speaking the same language and having the conversation through massive print media at roughly the same time. The new literacy, combined with the new irrelevance of Confucianism, sparked a wave of publications promoting religious worldviews in Vietnam. Most notably, Buddhism, which in Vietnam is a mix of Mahayana, coming from China, and Theravada Buddhism coming in through Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. And on the other hand, Catholicism, a product of French rule. Progressive, nationalists, and conservative examples can be found in the literature now being produced by organizations of both sets of religions, Buddhism and Catholicism. But in either case, their messages were spreading. Catholics argued that they could be both Christian and patriotic Vietnamese at the same time, while Buddhism was experiencing a significant revival. The most significant religious development of the period, however, was the emergence of the Gao Dai sect in Cochin, China in the 1920s. The Gao Dai sect was founded among groups of educated mid-level Vietnamese civil servants who held both rural and urban posts. It drew on Vietnamese interpretations of Taoism, a Buddhist message of salvation, secret society rituals introduced by overseas Chinese, the organizational structure of Catholicism, and French interests at the time in spiritism and seances and sort of communing with the dead and things like that, all of which were popular in and around Saigon. Now, Gao Dai was founded by Ngo Van Chiu, who grew up in the Mekong Delta, where Cochin China is, of course, and attended French schools and joined the civil service, so joined the government apparatus, in 1899. At temple seances in, eight, in 1918 and 1920, he claimed to have made contact with a spirit that he called Gao Dao Tian Ong, His Excellency the Immortal. Gao Dai itself is a Taoist term, and what it means is supreme being. Ngo Van Chu then befriended a high-level member of a Taoist sect in the Delta the Min Su, and became a vegetarian and became an adept of the spirit of Gao Dai. Soon he adopted the great eye as the symbol of the new religion. And you cannot, I wanted to show the grandeur of the Gao Dai temple, which still stands. You can go see it if you want to. If you go to Vietnam, go to Saigon, easy to find someone to take you out to see this temple. And it is absolutely 
lovely. When we return to class, I will show you uh, the picture of the eye. It looks very much like the eye on the top of a pyramid on the uh, back of a, the US $1 bill. Anyway, it's lovely. So Chu's ideas and the ideas of the Min Su Taoist sect with which he was associated spread among Vietnamese civil servants until, in 1926, the most senior colonial official among the new believers, Le Van Trung, began formally organizing the movement. By May 1926, Trung officially became the, the leader of the Gao Dai movement. Trung gained permission from the colonial government to establish 20 Gaudai oratories, churches, in Kokan, China, and began a petition for the official recognition of the new religion. The sect built its main temple northwest of Saigon in Tainin, where Trung became pope and a hierarchy of bishops, cardinals, and priests was established underneath him. The new church's pantheon included a wide range of people. You might guess the Buddha is there. You might guess Confucius, Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, are there. No problem so far. But also Moses, also Jesus, Muhammad, Victor Hugo, William Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, and China's uh, nationalist uh, icon, Sun Yat-sen. These are all also saints in the Gaudai pantheon. By 1928, Gao Dai had 200,000 believers. By 1930, this figure increased to 500,000, including many Khmer people, the dominant ethnicity in Cambodia. Our reading from the Kiernan gives a few different reasons why the sect might have been so successful. On the one hand, it emerged in a religious vacuum. Chinese Confucianism had been removed, Catholicism was seen as a religion of the oppressors, and Buddhist organizations, although they were experiencing a bit of a revival, had been on the decline for quite a long time. Thus, Gao Dai may have answered a need for some sort of salvation story and a higher calling among the peasants in the Delta. On the other hand, Gao Dai was remarkably organized despite falling outs between different congregations, different oratories. Members could join collective farming programs or take jobs in handicrafts and small-scale manufacturing. Gaudai also offered hospital services and schooling, serving over 20,000 students in that main branch pictured here in Tainin. Gaudai's Office of Social Services employed 6,000 workers on three rubber plantations. It employed 100 public enterprises and it employed people in its hospitals. No other organization in Kokan, China could claim to bring that much benefit to the region and claim that kind of organizational stability. So there are both, we can say, uh, spiritual or yeah, ideational reasons that Gao Dai might have become so influential. There are also material reasons. People need to eat, people need to work, those kinds of things to help explain why this religion that seems uh, so wonderfully eclectic and weird absolutely took off in the 1920s in southern Vietnam. In 1919, we finally get our first Vietnamese-run political party, and you might imagine it is not a very radically progressive party. We get the Constitutionalist Party of Kokan, China. So this party's politics were relatively pro-French, and its members were wealthy. They were French-educated urban Southerners who were committed to French-Vietnamese collaboration because they believed that was the best path to modernize Vietnam. The party also advocated that the French government, with, it, with which it was formally registered, recognize the skills and talents of Vietnamese professionals and allow them to take part in governmental decision-making. So basically, they are arguing there are elites, there are educated people in Vietnam who should be able to help participate in a certain level of self-determination in Vietnam, and they want the French government not to give them independence, but just to recognize that fact and make room for these people. So in sum, the goal was to make the most out of French rule for Vietnam. 
In August 1919, the new party launched its first political campaign in the form of a boycott against Chinese merchants in Saigon, who they believed were hurting the development of Vietnamese-owned businesses. The campaign for increased Vietnamese participation in government was a slow numbers game. In 1920, only 1,800 Vietnamese out of Cochin China's 3.8 million people were allowed to vote in elections for the Colonial Council of Cochin China, in which French citizens held seven seats and only four could be held by Vietnamese. By 1922, these figures increased. 20,000 of Cochin China's wealthy, educated elite were allowed to vote, and Vietnamese could now hold as many as 10 seats, while French could held somewhere between 10 and 12. In 1922, the Constitutionalist Party and its allies won five of these seats. In elections in 1926, the Constitutionalists won all 10 of these seats. By 1939, 20 Vietnamese people were working in the top levels of Cochinchine's governmental bureaucracy. So, in a very limited sense, the Constitutionalist Party's program seems to be having some effect. Over time, the Constitutionalist Party struggled, however, with the contradiction that is suffered by all subordinate elites, all locally powerful people who collaborate with the colonial administration. On the one hand, they wanted gradually increasing participation in government and rights to French citizenship. On the other hand, their support of French rule was often questioned when the French demanded exclusive access to Vietnamese resources or political rights. In the end, this small group of wealthy landlord politicians lost its relevance. But it was still significant as the earliest organized political voice in Vietnam. As you can guess, in this class, there's another big political voice coming down the pipe. Let us talk about that other voice. Ho Chi Minh lived and worked in Paris from 1917 to 1923, and here you have him pictured in, I believe, 1921. In 1919, the year of the Constitutional Party's founding, Ho joined the French Socialist Party under the pseudonym Nguyen I Guoc, which is one of his more famous pseudonyms. He has dozens of fake names under which he would write articles or travel around clandestinely. Nguyen I Guoc is one of the most famous, I guess second to Ho Chi Minh, which is itself a Chinese name, Hu Zhi Ming, uh, and not his actual name. In December 1920, Ho joined the French Communist Party, and at its founding meeting, he announced, quote, I didn't understand what you said about strategy, proletarian tactics, and other points. But there's one thing I do understand clearly. The Third International, the Comintern, is interested in the problem of liberating the colonies. So we see that that's, you know, very reasonably key to his connection to communist politics. For the rest of his time in Paris, Ho wrote about the horrors of French colonialism in Vietnam, Algeria, and Madagascar for a leftist newspaper run by other foreign nationals in France. By 1924, Ho was in Moscow. In the Soviet Union, he took courses in politics and was connected with communists from across Asia, including those from India and China. The Communist International, the Common Turn, sent Ho to China, where he spent the next 20 years of his life covertly organizing a Vietnamese communist movement on the border. During the first united front between the Chinese Communist Party and the Guomintang, Ho served as the translator for the Soviet advisor Borodin. In Guangzhou, Ho founded the League of Vietnamese Revolutionary Youth the first Vietnamese Communist Party organization. Let's stop for a moment because I skipped over something very important here, a, a little piece of history. You will recall the first united front between the Chinese Communist Party and the Guomintang. Ho's first position in China was to act as a translator between Soviet advisors like Borodin and this united front, largely, you know, dealing perhaps in his politics with the CCP, but working directly with 
uh, Chiang Kai-shek, and the Guomintang. So there's a deep Chinese connection here, running fairly far back. You will also recall that this place, that the Guomintang were centered in Guangzhou, and that in Guangzhou is exactly where Ho Chi Minh fa founds his first communi communist organization. I just mentioned the League of Vietnamese Revolutionary Youth. So, China connection, very deep. We will see more examples of that as we move forward. The next step after founding this League of Vietnamese Revolutionary Youth was to begin training members of the new organization. From 1925 to 1927, Ho Chi Minh and his Revolutionary Youth Party brought roughly 300 Vietnamese activists to southern China for training. Some even went to Huangpu or Wampo Academy. Most received training in communist theory and organizing methods, and were then returned to Vietnam to help build the movement among workers and peasants. Some of the graduates from this training helped establish the first labor union in Tonkin. Members of the ethnic minority groups Thai and Nung in northern Vietnam also joined the effort, training in China and then returning to organize rural upland ethnic minority people to the Vietnamese communist cause. Still others went on to study further in the Soviet Union. The opportunity for training in China, however, came to an end in 1927, and you know exactly why, because of Chiang Kai-shek's white terror. Ho escaped to Moscow himself, eventually returning to Southeast Asia through Siam. In the late 1920s, Ho's movement began suffering splits. A decidedly less radical organization called the New Vietnam Revolutionary Party approached Ho's group about an alliance, but they were rejected. In 1929, a breakaway group, calling themselves the Indochina Communist Party, emerged and incorporated all of the communists operating in Tonkin and Da Nang. Still another group emerged called Annamese Communism, with 400 members and 800 probationary members. In October 1929, the Comintern ordered an end to the factionalism and sent Ho Chi Minh back to southern China to work out a solution. On February 3rd, 1930, in Hong Kong, Ho held a secret meeting that finally combined all these groups under the same name, the Vietnamese Communist Party. The only remaining popular competition, uh, the Vietnamese Nationalist Party, was founded in 1927 and was modeled on the Guomindang in China. It gained some popularity in Tonkin and tried to launch a revolt in February of 1930. The action, however, was a failure and the group's leaders were arrested. The key organizers were publicly executed in June of 1930 and the Nationalist Party, although it continues to exist, never really recovered. The event fueled mass unrest among the Vietnamese peasantry. From April 1930 to November 1931, a sustained revolt erupted. In over 500 rural demonstrations, peasants took over land and rice stores across Vietnam. Over 100 workers' strikes occurred in support of the peasant movement. As peasants focused the violence on landlords, Catholics, and French citizens, the new Vietnamese Communist Party sought a way to lead the movement, often succeeding. The response from the colonial government was brutal. In September 1930, French-led troops and aircraft killed almost 200 peasants in a single clash. The killing continued further into the hundreds once the French were back in control. 9,000 suspected uh, of participating in these revolts were arrested, and in central Vietnam, another 3,000 peasants were killed in reprisals for the revolt. In southern Annam, a 30-year-old Catholic Mandarin from the city of Hue, named Ngo Dinh Diem, acted as police chief while suppressing the peasant movement in Ninh Thuan province. For his ruthlessness, the French administration promoted him uh, to chief over the much larger police force in the much larger province of Binh Thuan. Remember his name, Ngo Dinh Diem, although that seems like a non-sequitur here. We're going to come back to him. During the revolt, the Comintern ordered the changing of the Vietnamese Communist Party's name 
to the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, and their flag is pictured here on our slide, which was designed to reflect the goal of liberating Laos and Cambodia in addition to Vietnam, although participation by Lao and Cambodian communists in this organization was, although it existed, it was very small. In 1931, one French police commissioner reported that six out of every ten peasants in Ngan and Ha Tin provinces had either joined the ICP or one of its peasant associations. In October 1930, the ICP met in Saigon for its first plenum. It faced a problem. In Ngan and Ha Tin, the provinces circled on our previous slide, Peasant revolutionaries had already begun establishing Soviets, the kind of organizations that we saw established in the early 1930s in China with the Jiangxi Soviet. The ICP, however, or its Central Committee, firmly believed that the time was not right because they were not organizationally strong enough and they were not well-armed enough to maintain and protect these new Soviets. The ICP didn't start the revolt of 1930 and 1931, but they did succeed in using it as an opportunity to become the leaders of the Vietnamese liberation movement. During this time, the only place where the ICP was in charge or beginning the peasant revolts was in Kokan, China, and it was there that the revolt was most extensive. At the ICP's second plenum in March 1931, the French police succeeded in apprehending one central committee member, and in the coming months, nearly all of the top leadership, including three future party secretaries general, Truong Chin, Le Duan, and Nguyen Van Lin. Ho was arrested in Hong Kong then in June 1931, but he managed to escape British custody and eventually traveled to Moscow and then from Moscow to Mao Zedong's revolutionary base at Yan'an, while the future of the ICP remained uncertain for the remainder of the 1930s. And now Yan'an has become a very significant revolutionary hub for most of Asia. It is not just the CCP who are at Yan'an building their organization. Mao is writing all of his sort of more important texts on practice, on contradiction, and so forth. It's also, we have Ho Chi Minh traveling through Yan'an, connecting with the CCP, watching them organize, building his own ideas, also, if you recall from the Reynolds and Lisa article, there was a very famous CPT member, Udom Sisawan, author of Thailand, a semi-colony. He himself also spent time in the 1930s at Yan'an in Mao Zedong's revolutionary base. So this really is a kind of a brief revolutionary mecca for the decade or so that it existed for revolutionaries across East and Southeast Asia. Now, just as it happened in China, just as it happened in Thailand, World War II is coming, fascism is coming. As the threat of German fascism grew in Europe, a popular front government emerged in France in May 1936 that included socialists and communists. Socialist Marius Mautet became overseas minister and oversaw the release of 1,500 prisoners in Indochina, mostly political prisoners. At the same time, the Comintern changed its own policies on communist parties working with other organizations and encouraged collaboration between all anti-fascist groups. Political repression in Vietnam, for the time being, decreased, although it did not disappear. The ICP and Trotskyist politicians began winning elections in what government seats were at the time available for the Vietnamese uh, natives to occupy. So in Vietnam, the party begins taking an urban-based electoral path to what they hope will be victory. The Catholic response during this period to the United Front politics, this idea of a popular front, the idea that all of these organizations could get together and fight fascism, was far less flexible than the communist response. Powerful Vietnamese Catholics worried about cooperation with atheists, and in Saigon they openly feared for what might happen to their property if the United Front was a success. 
In Anam, anti-imperialism took hold of Catholics in the imperial cabinet, that uh, dual government beside the French protectorate government. In May 1933, the French moved the Catholic prime minister, who had pushed for the restoration of Vietnamese monarchical power. This same prime minister promoted Ngo Dinh Diem, who we just mentioned a moment ago, to interior minister within the Anam government, and Diem is pictured on our slide here. However, Diem resigned from this position, protesting in a letter to Emperor Bao Dai that the French were still unwilling to give enough power to native governance. Although Diem was now, compared to uh, the, his position in the peasant revolts of 1930 and 31, Diem is now anti-French. He is still not pro-communist or willing to work with the communists. Throughout the remainder of the decade, ICP tactics focused on labor strikes, public protest, peasant organization, and political participation elections. It slowly absorbed or politically defeated other leftist organizations, and by 1937, it was the only Vietnamese party operating on a national scale. It's not the only Vietnamese po political party, but the only one that has representatives throughout Vietnam and an organization that spans all of Vietnam. This political path, however, this idea of a popular front, uh, comes in direct confrontation with Japanese occupation and with the rightward turn of the French occupation under the Vichy regime. Let's explain that a little bit. So Germany invaded France in May of 1940. A new puppet government was established in the city of Vichy in France that was allied with Nazi Germany and responsible for the administration of Indochina. In September 1940, Japanese troops began moving into Indochina, bombing Haiphong and killing 37 civilians. French officials agreed to a Japanese military occupation that would nonetheless allow them to maintain control of the colonial administration. We'll get into the why of that in just a moment. Japan garrisoned 6,000 troops in northern Tonkin and was allowed to use four airfields and deployed another 30,000 troops throughout the protectorate. By 1945, the total number of Japanese forces in Vietnam reached 55,000, with another 4,000 civilians. In all, this was a larger presence than the French had ever placed in Indochina. Uh, the French themselves had a 60,000-strong colonial army, but it was made up mostly of Vietnamese men, with less than 12,000 Europeans as part of this army. The combined French-Japanese forces set about arresting anti-colonial uh, resistance of all kinds. In February 1941, Ho Chi Minh left China and entered Vietnam for the first time since 1911. At the ICP's eighth plenum in May of that year, Ho and others pledged to, quote, awaken the traditional nationalism of the people. They established the League for the Independence of Vietnam, and I'm not going to embarrass uh, myself or anyone who knows Vietnamese better than I do by reading the entire name, but if you look at the name on the slide, you will quickly see how shorthand for, in Vietnamese, for League for the Independence of Vietnam becomes a name you're much more familiar with, the Viet Minh. So the Viet Minh's goal was to fight a revolution for national liberation against the Japanese and the French. Slowly, it began taking over districts on the Sino-Vietnamese border in the province of Gao Bang. In early August of 1942, Ho Chi Minh returned to China to meet with Soviet and U.S. delegations to the Guomindang government to try to gain allied support for the Viet Minh, Viet Minh's cause. However, his identity was discovered and the Guomindang arrested him, leaving him in prison until September of 1943. Eventually, Ho convinced the Guomindang that he could act as a source of information on Indochina, and he was released after agreeing to join a rival Vietnamese independent movement. Independence movement. In March 1944, Ho was finally allowed to travel after U.S. officials negotiated with the Guomindang on his behalf. By the summer of 44, 
Ho Chi Minh was working with American organizations on propaganda activities in Vietnam. And finally, by September of that year, 1944, Ho finally returned to Vietnam with 200 Vietnamese exiles. The Japanese occupied Vietnam, and this gets to the why are the French and Japanese willing to govern together. The Japanese occupied Vietnam to get supplies for their war effort elsewhere, mostly in China. They were happy to leave the French in charge if the Japanese military could requisition materials as needed. These materials included, importantly, rice and cash crops like cotton. The conversion of rice farms to cotton farms combined with rice requisitions meant that by 1944, Vietnamese farmers were barely able to feed themselves because either the Japanese are taking their rice or the Japanese are forcing them to convert their farms into farms for things like cotton, which you cannot eat, and which the Japanese nonetheless requisition. So they're, they're causing a sort of human-made famine, or they're threatening one. The Viet Minh began a campaign protesting the handover of rice to the Japanese. In December 1944, the Viet Minh's core fighting force was made up of only 34 fighters who had between them 17 rifles, but they were commanded by a man named Vo Nguyen Giep, who is going to wind up, he is pictured in a tie and hat in the photo on the PowerPoint uh, with U.S. OSS officers. He's going to wind up to be the key military leader in the Vietnamese Revolution. In November 44, the Viet Minh rescued a U.S. pilot named Lieutenant Rudolph Shaw, who crashed over Gaobong province. Ho returned Shaw in person to U.S. officials in China, including officials from that acronym I just used, the U.S. OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which is a forerunner for the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. When Ho returned to Vietnam once more in May 1945, this time he brought with him 40 American OSS advisors and military instructors. These people began training the Viet Minh on how to find downed U.S. pilots and how to fight back in a more effective way against the Japanese. Meanwhile, in August 1944, in Europe, Paris was liberated. The new de Gaulle government took power. Japan distrusted the loyalty of the French administration in Indochina and launched its own coup against that French administration in March 1945. With the French out of the way, the Japanese created a puppet government out of Vietnamese royals. Emperor Bao Dai tried to get Ngo Dinh Diem to lead the new government, but Diem refused. Famine swept through Tonkin and northern Annam, famine created by earlier Japanese policies. By mid-1945, over one million people had died of hunger, roughly 10% of the population of Tonkin. Then in August of the same year, flooding destroyed about 33% of the summer rice crop. As soon as the Japanese removed the French administration, the Viet Minh began their attack against Japan. They attacked rice stores, they distributed rice to the peasantry, and assaulted select Japanese outposts. Soon the Japanese abandoned six provinces in northern Tonkin, leaving them for Viet Minh to control. Viet Minh attacks against the Japanese were small and measured. The biggest single assault on July 16, 1945, resulted in the deaths of only seven Japanese troops and the capture of one major. After the battle, U.S. forces parachuted in to show the Viet Minh how to use the weapons they had captured from the Japanese. Most of the Viet Minh's work went into organizing. By July 1945, they were estimated to have recruited 150,000 people in Tonkin, 20,000 people in Annam, and 10,000 people in Kokin, China. The ICP had grown to 5,000 members, but only 60 of these members were in Hanoi. They, uh, there were, in addition, 600 Viet Minh in the city, but they, between them, had only a total of 80 rifles. 
On August 13, the Viet Minh got word that the Japanese had surrendered. They moved quickly and capitalized on the fruits of their years of organizing. As the Japanese surrendered town and countryside, local Viet Minh committees came in to take over governance. Although the number of ICP and Viet Minh members in Hanoi were small, the smoothness of their takeover and the lack of violence was only possible because most Vietnamese people at this point in the war now saw them as the only leading group uh, trying to advance Vietnamese independence and the only group with a plan on how to handle the Japanese-caused famine. By August 19, the ICP and Viet Minh controlled Hanoi. By August 23, they controlled the old imperial capital at Hue. By August 25, they controlled Saigon. The whole country was now under Viet Minh control, prompting Emperor Bao Dai to abdicate the throne. On September 2nd, Ho Chi Minh proclaimed the establishment of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and issued its Declaration of Independence. Japanese surrender was officially handled by the Guomindang in the north, that is in Annam and Tonkin, and by the British in the south, that is in Kokan, China. Neither power wanted the ICP to take control of Vietnam. The Guomindang did not want a CCP ally on its southern border, while the British feared that an independent Vietnam would spark revolutions in its own colonies. The Viet Minh themselves worked quickly to establish a police force and the structures for a new parliament. This period, so between August 1945 and March 1946, saw several political assassinations by Viet Minh groups against rival leftists and right-wing leaders, but Ho Chi Minh also gave rival parties 70 out of a total of 400 seats to be decided in the new parliament. In November 1945, under Guomindang pressure, Ho officially disbanded the ICP, which really meant that the ICP continued to exist but just underground. In the south, the British were firmer in their opposition to any native Vietnamese rule. As French forces began to return to Kokan, China, they worked with the British to drive the Viet Minh out of Saigon. By March 1946, Ho negotiated the withdrawal of 100,000 Guomindang troops in exchange for the return of 15,000 French troops. The French refused to allow Kokan, China to join the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, but they agreed to withdraw themselves from the DRV by 1952 and begin negotiations on the relationship between France and Vietnam. By October, French forces had increased to 75,000 troops. Meanwhile, a similar buildup was occurring on the Vietnamese side. The Democratic Republic of Vietnam now had 50,000 troops and regional guerrilla forces, and the ICP's political cadres had grown to roughly the same size. Throughout this period, Ho's hope was that the work that he and the ICP had done with the United States during the war would prompt American leaders to support Vietnamese independence. He was wrong. Instead, Washington preferred French control over Indochina. On November 23, 1946, four French warships attacked Haiphong, killing thousands of civilians. As the French advanced, the Viet Minh began their counterattacks in December. This then was the beginning of the First Indochina War and the end of a very brief period of hopeful Vietnamese independence at the very end of the Second World War. Unlike previous anti-colonial efforts in Vietnam, however, this time the Vietnamese had an established state and an army that they could use in the war itself, and that would, both of which would develop and build in the war itself. And as in China, we will find out, war strengthened the party both in terms of its dip discipline, in terms of its organizational skill. So when we pick up next time, we will look at both the first and second Indochina wars, that is the war between France and Vietnam, and then the war between the U.S. and Vietnam. So we will go from 1946 until 1975. 
and I will see you in that video. Thanks.